It's almost church camp time. We are really close to July, and the first group will be headed off this week, and we still need some van drivers. So um, there is a sign up in the social hall if you and someone else would like to join us for um, a little travel to Crowder State Park. You can sign up for that. And then don't forget, in July, we will be having one worship at 10 a.m. Say it with me. One worship, 10 a.m. Yeah. So um, if you come early, you just get to hang out with the staff, and we'll put you to work. So there's your, there's your warning. And then after service today, members need to hang around. We have a congregational vote to do. We need to um, take care of some business stuff. So that is the announcements for the day. But... I do want to say a huge thank you. Um, last week was Vacation Bible School. As you can see, we still have a bunch of stuff up here. It'll come down this week. I'm kind of sad, but that's okay. It looks so bare up here when it's all gone. But just thank you to all the volunteers. We had almost 50 volunteers here over the course of the four nights, and um, it was an amazing opportunity to get to pour into some kids. We had um, 56 kids here. Um, each night they brought a bunch of energy and we challenged them to a lot of different things this year. We had our junior mission team. They made some blankets um, that will be going to Texas um, for the kids at Uvidel. They're trying to collect 4,300 blankets so that when school starts, every single child has a blanket and that's through Project Linus. So our junior mission kids did that. All of our kids brought in food for InterServe because we challenged them to think about what other children might need. And they brought in 662 food items this week. Yeah. So um, I don't, I'm a firm believer that everybody can do something no matter what your age. And um, these kids showed up big time. So I want to invite our kids up so that we can do a couple of our songs. We're going to do food truck party first, and then we're going to do five, two, one, eat, um, which were a lot of fun. If you didn't guess, our food truck on a roll all week was teaching us about how God gives us um, our daily bread. And so the kiddos um, should be headed up. Nobody's headed up. I'm going to do it all by myself. Leslie and I are going to sing by ourselves here, kids. Like, I know there's several of you here, so... Come on up, kids. And, oh, be careful. Don't fall. He tripped over the step. Come on up. Spread out. You don't have to be all next to each other. Spread out, spread out, spread out. 662, Owen. I know, can you count that high? No. Atticus counted them for me. Is this everybody? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a fast-moving song. the word. 
You may go back and sit with your families. Thank you guys all so much. You guys did a great job. Need some help? There you go. Awesome. Okay, I think we're ready to worship. Kids, that was awesome. I don't know why the rest of you are sitting down. Let's stand up. God for the daylight. I spent a long time in the dark. Tell good saying goodnight. Waking up to a brand new heart. And if you're sleeping like I used to be, in a grave that holds you tight, and the Savior calling. Promising a brand new life. He's saying, Wake up, sleeper. Somebody's sleeping like the way you used to be. Tell them 
about the Savior. And a little thing called free. Go ahead, say, wake up, sleeper. Open your eyes. Oh, sinner, arise. Leave your past at the door. Wake up, sleeper. Come to the light. Christ is alive. Death don't live here anymore. Rise up and come out of that grave. Rise up in that amazing grave. Father, we thank you for the light that awakens us, us, your children, your disciples, your sinners. And at the beginning of the day, Lord, that is all we are, sinners. We turn away from you. We cut corners. We take shortcuts, and we take the easy road. We tear down others who act different and who think different who believe different in an effort to make ourselves look better. That is only the beginning of the day. At the end of the day, you have provided us with the light that awakens us, the light that shows that we can be forgiven, the light that brings us on the path to you. Father, open the eyes of our hearts so that we can see this world and all of our brothers and sisters, your children, the way that you see us. And then your children can join together the way you wanted us to be, and together we can leave the darkness and run out of our graves into your glorious day. It's in your holy son's name we pray. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind? was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name.
I needed rescue, but my sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call me, Let's stay standing for our scripture. Good morning, everyone. Our scripture today comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 15 through 18. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight and repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Sing together. Good morning, Wyatt Park. It is great to see you this morning. And before I get into the prayer time, I just want to recognize here in our midst, we have Aaron and Sarah Michaud. Would you stand up, Aaron? And let's give them a Wyatt Park welcome here. And welcome into our midst. So we are talking to Aaron about coming and being our next youth and young adult pastor here at uh, Wyatt Park Christian Church. And uh, they have two boys that are back home in the state of Washington, Asher and Asa. And so we're excited for the potential here because it really seems like God has brought them at just the right time. There's, there's a connection. There's energy. They love Jesus. And guess what? We all love Jesus here too. So I think there's a good match here. And so we're going to... 
continue to look, uh, just kind of having these conversations and seeing what God would do in our midst. And so welcome to you both. Um, Whatever you've brought with you into this place today, as we go before the Lord in prayer, let me just invite you to um, bring whatever it is that you have. You may think that it's too big or too weighty for God to to handle, and I I know sometimes I feel that. Sometimes I feel like maybe God just doesn't want to hear what I have to say, what's going on in my mind today. Um, Let's just erase that from our minds today. Let's just say that's a lie from Satan, okay? Because God, your Heavenly Father, knows what you want to say even before you say it, knows all of your unspoken thoughts. And so let us be transparent before God as we go in prayer today. We're continuing to pray pray for Pastor Cindy. Uh, She's had a a pretty good week of rehab. It's difficult to go through the rehab that she's going through. So continue to pray for her, for stamina, for strength, for healing. And of course, she says thank you to everyone once again for all of your your calls, your cards, text all of the ways that you've reached out to let Pastor Cindy know that you love her and are praying for her. So let's continue to do that. Let's start off with a moment of silence. I invite you to lift up to God what you have in your heart and mind today. Then I'll say some words and we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer today. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that we don't have to ask you to be present with us. We never have to ask you to be present with us because you are already present. What is missing in those moments is our awareness of your presence. Lord, we admit that oftentimes we are too busy to notice your presence. We are too distracted to know that you are close with us. Sometimes we don't feel your closeness. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand that it's not always about feeling your presence, but having a trust that even through the hardest times and through the dark times and through the times where we feel like you are silent, that you are always right there comforting and holding us, that your strength, your grace is what we depend upon each and every day. And so indeed, Lord, today, with all that we have brought with us into this place, We look to you, we lift our eyes up to the mountains. Where does our help come from? And we say with the psalmist that it comes from you, the creator, the maker of heaven and earth. So we thank you today for your generosity, for your presence in our lives. We thank you for Wyatt Park Christian Church and our ministry here in St. Joseph, Missouri for such a time as this. We thank you for being with Pastor Cindy as she is currently in the rehab facility. May your Holy Spirit just be with her in a way that she has never experienced before. Just be so tangible in that room with her today. Give her the stamina that she needs and the strength to continue this rehab that she might be back here with us soon. Thank you for Aaron and Sarah. Thank you for Asher and Asa who are back in Washington. We ask that as we continue these conversations this weekend, Lord, that you would just inspire our hearts as we dream about what you would have here for us at Wyatt Park. Uh, We ask that everybody, whether they've been coming here Sunday after Sunday or any visitor that's here in this place today, uh, that any distractions, anything that would cause us to, to zone out from what you would say to us, whether in music or at the table or in word, Lord, that you would plant the seed of your gospel, the good news, into our hearts today. We give you thanks and praise for all of your, your love and activity in our life. And now together we join our voices in the Lord's prayers. We say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
We light this candle again as a reminder of Christ's presence with us at this table. May the flame that burns on this candle burn in your heart as we gather once more with our Savior who bids us to come. As you come forward for communion here in just a little bit, if you would like to offer your gifts, your offerings, any tithes to forward the ministry of this congregation, we have offering plates on either side of the aisle over here. You could just drop them in there. We also have uh, an, an app where you can give your tithes and offerings mobily as well. But as we come to this table, um, I'm reminded of meeting with my family this past weekend. My oldest brother, Eric, was in Kansas City with his three daughters, and so Eliana got to hang out with her cousins. And uh, the youngest daughter of my brother, Eric, and his wife, Liz, her name is Lily. And we happened to be at Wendy's this past week, and I don't know what we were eating, but something that she ate was just really good, and she had to let us know. And so she kind of, she put her head back and she goes, this is so good. <laughs> it's so good. She kept doing that. It's so good. She kept doing it over and over again, you know, and we just kind of thought, all right, it must be really good. It, she's not lying here, right? And there's been times where I've had something where I was like, it's so good. <laughs> Last time that happened, we were on the mission trip with the youth who are no longer sitting in here, but um, <laughs> we were out working in a garden in, in Michigan, and it was getting hot and humid outside, and we made some sandwiches. Just plain Jane sandwiches, wheat sandwiches with turkey, lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise, something I can make at home, very common. And I remember after working hard in the garden, doing some weeding and sweating a lot, I sat down to eat that plain Jane sandwich and I thought, it's so good. <laughs> Why, why is that? Why? I mean, I, I can make that sandwich at home. When we got back from the mission trip, that's what I did. I went and got wheat bread, got some cold cuts, some lettuce and tomatoes, and it wasn't as good as after I got done working hard in the garden. And so I thought, well, maybe perhaps it's because I was hot, I was sweaty, I was ready for a break, and just it all sort of came together after working hard to sit down and eat, that food did something to me. It, it lifted my spirits. It, it said, hey, you can keep going. For, there's more work to be done, but first, sit down and eat. That's what this table is. It's our moment of pausing. It's our moment of, we've been out this week living as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, working hard, sweating, toiling with our neighbors, loving our neighbors as ourselves. That's hard work. And so when we come to this table and we say, <laughs> it's so good. It's a little piece of cracker and a little thing of juice. But the, the work, the, the, the cycle is you eat and then you go and work. And then we come back here to eat, receive of God's grace and love, and then we're going to go back out and work. And then in a week we're going to come back here and we're going to eat again. Would you join me in saying, it's so good! <laughs> Let's pray. Lord in heaven, we thank you for this meal that is so good. It's better than we deserve. Your love, your grace meets us all. Whether we are in the lowest moments of our life or the highest mountain whether we have it all together or whether we've got some pieces to put in place, whether we're confident or maybe we come to this place doubting today. Lord, today we come to this table transparent before you. We're hungry. We need to be fed by you. And so may this bread and this cup be to us, your body and your blood. We pray today in Jesus' name. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, he blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. He broke it and he gave it to or He blessed the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. And every time that we eat of this bread and every time we drink of this cup, we proclaim the mystery of faith. That Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. 
Amen. My friends, come and meet us here at this table. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. We live for you. It's awesome. Thank you. It's for me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who can ever say, Mark. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you.
Thank you, praise team. Always appreciate what you do to lead us into the presence of God here Sunday morning. Today we are going to continue in our summer smorgasbord series. And uh, so this is the second week of doing this. A few weeks ago I asked you to give me some topics and scriptures to teach about, think about. And so um, this next scripture that we're going to read here in just a minute from Matthew 15 Verse 21 is going to be up next. Talk about the faith of the Canaanite woman. So as you're turning in your Bibles, the Pew Bible page numbers are on the screen there if you need that. As you're turning there, thinking about the month of July, every Sunday in July, one service at 10 a.m. Probably can't say that enough, right? And if you do come early, there, there will be some coffee. There will be a few donuts. So if you want to come a little bit earlier and sort of get that fellowship time in, uh, please do that. Um, or if we do have work to do, we'll put you to work as well. So we'll figure it out. Um, but if you know somebody who maybe doesn't know, if you know somebody who might forget or be confused, feel free to reach out to them this week and say, hey, one service, 10 a.m. all throughout July. We'll do this. We'll get through this together. And I look forward to seeing us all together for that service. So here we go, Matthew chapter 15 beginning in verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. When I asked for ideas for this summer smorgasbord series, I wasn't sure what to expect. But I was happy to see that someone suggested this morning's text because it's one that I have wrestled with myself through the years. This will be the third time that I've preached on this particular story from Matthew 15. The faith of the Canaanite woman, or as Mark, the Gospel of Mark calls her, the Syrophoenician woman. So the first time I preached on this was in Darlington, Indiana, my very first call as a pastor, as a 24-year-old, not wet behind the ears, I don't think I was at that time, pastor, and so I, a friend of mine introduced me to the lectionary readings, this three-year cycle of weekly readings, of reading through the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Psalms, the Epistles. And after my first year of preaching in Darlington, I started running out of soapboxes to stand upon. I started running out of things to preach about, and so I gladly took on this practice of preaching through the lectionary because it gave me scriptures and things that I would have never chosen to preach about. And so the first time that this text popped up in the lectionary readings, I read it and I was a, I was a little thrown off by it, but I was like, all I got to do is read my commentaries and they'll tell me what to say. Read my commentaries and they will sanitize this story for me. Why does Jesus call this woman a dog? Why does he treat her like that at the beginning of the interaction? And so I turned to my commentaries, and I was like, sanitize this a little bit for me. Make it easier for me to preach. And the commentary sanitized it for me. They did a good job. They, they said, you know, well, Jesus wasn't calling her a dog, like, in a bad way, right? They were suggesting that he was calling her a dog in the sense that the kind of dog that sits on the owner's lap. The kind of dog who is allowed to sit under the kitchen table and get the crumbs off the floor. The kind of dog that has a collar with a name tag on it, or it might be microchipped and gets to sleep at the end of the bed. Now, some people might say, my dog 
doesn't sleep at the end of the bed. My dog sleeps right next to us on the bed, right? So, so it's that kind of dog. It's a beloved family pet. Jesus was only calling her a beloved family pet. So that sanitized it for me well enough. And I preached that, and I said, well, Jesus wasn't really just calling her a, a bad... It's just, you know, we're just taking that, that out of context. And so three years later, I was serving in Bastrop, Texas. I'd been through the lectionary cycle for the very first time of my life, three years of preaching through the lectionary. And this text was back up for me to preach. Before I got to looking at the lectionary text and saw that this was the gospel lesson for that Sunday... I don't remember exactly what happened, but something that week, there was a, some sort of murder that was racially uh, motivated. There was a racially motivated murder, and it was, it, it, it was one of those events that became headline news for us here in America. And so that happens. There's this racial motivated event that happens, and I turned to the gospel text, and I read it, and it bothered me in a way that it didn't bother me three years before. I struggled all week to write that message, and I even remember telling Becca, I said, I don't know what I'm going to preach about. I'm having a hard time with this text. I wasn't content to, to read the same sanitized commentaries that were seemingly afraid to dig into the, the real background of the text. It, it just didn't make sense to me. In every other interaction that Jesus has, with anyone in the Gospel of Matthew, anyone who approaches him with faith and humility, he never responded like he did here with this Canaanite woman. And if you would say, well, this woman wasn't a Jew, she was a Gentile, I would remind you that the only other interaction that Jesus has with a Gentile in the Gospel of Matthew is with a Roman centurion. He is like the highest ranking pagan living inside the Holy Land who comes up to Jesus and he says, my daughter is deathly ill. She's she's, going to die. I need you to just speak a word. You don't even have to go to my daughter. Just speak the word and my daughter will be healed. And so Jesus does for this Roman centurion, this invader, this this enemy of the people of Israel, at the very top of that ladder, Jesus heals the daughter of this Roman centurion. No wonder Jesus' own people wanted to crucify him because he was colluding and sympathizing with the enemy. The centurion had that kind of faith to believe, and Jesus healed his daughter. And not only that, Jesus says this about the Roman centurion. He says, truly, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Jesus wasn't talking about his own people here. He was talking about the pagan Roman army, the commander of the army in Israel, saying, I have not seen such great faith. And so before we say that, well, Jesus treated this lady like this because she wasn't a Jew, we have to rethink that because his interaction with the centurion didn't go this way. So if we think that Jesus' words to the Canaanite woman is in line with his own thoughts towards Gentiles, we would be mistaken. On the surface, Jesus' conversation with the Canaanite woman makes no sense. And it's okay to admit that it's a bit disturbing at first glance. Thankfully, there are theologians and commentators who are not content to get to the easy answers of the story who are willing to wrestle a little bit with the text and the history. And so I'm going to drop a little thought for you to consider today and pray that you have ears to hear and a mind to understand what the Spirit would say today. So first of all, note when Mark writes about the story, he calls the woman a Syro-Phoenician Greek. Mark is just stating facts here. He's just saying this is who she is. But Matthew calls her a Canaanite woman. A Canaanite woman. Do you remember the Canaanites in the Old Testament? You remember the story about the Canaanites in the Old Testament? They were the original inhabitants of the Promised Land. The Israelites had many battles 
with the Canaanites throughout their history. And all throughout their history, the Canaanites were a thorn in Israel's side. And so Matthew intentionally describes this woman with a term that would have caused his readers to bristle. A Canaanite woman? The enemy? An outsider? Someone who's unworthy of God's love and forgiveness? This should have raised questions for Matthew's original audience, which would have been mainly Jewish people. It would have raised this question of why is Jesus going into Tyre and Sidon in the first place? Why go into Tyre and Sidon if he did not want to come into contact with a Canaanite woman? Why go there in the first place? Can you imagine the disciples walking behind Jesus as he's going into Gentile territory outside the bounds of the Holy Lands? Perhaps their questions might be, where are we going? What are we doing? Is Jesus, Jesus must be lost. We shouldn't be here. So think about it this way. Let's say you're on a diet. You're trying to watch what you eat. And you know that donuts are your downfall. Or donut, I want to ask that question. Um, <laughs> donuts are your downfall. You're on a diet. So what are you going to avoid? You're not going to go into Dunkin' Donuts, right? Just to get a smell of the donuts. You're not going to stroll slowly through the bakery section at Hy-Vee, I'm going to assume, right? You're going to kind of walk by and sort of blind yourself, right? If, if you don't want donuts, you're not going to go to a bakery because you know if you do, there's going to be a showdown between you and a long john. It's going to happen. You're going to come into contact with a donut. And so who do you think Jesus expected to run into in Canaanite territory? Can we say that Jesus was surprised or caught off guard that this Canaanite woman approached him? Or can we say Jesus expected that interaction to happen and even sought out that interaction? Now remember that Jesus is with his disciples. The word disciple simply means a student. Someone who is a learner following in the footsteps of someone else. The disciples were apprentices of Jesus. They traveled him with him from town to town for three straight years. Day and night, they're with Jesus, learning what Jesus would do, how he would want them to live and think and act and speak and treat others. And so one day in the future, Jesus is going to tell his disciples, I'm out of here. Now you go and make the same disciples that I just made out of you. Go and do the same things that I taught you. Live in the way that I lived. If you back up to Matthew chapter 14, the story of the feeding of the 4,000, the, the feeding of the multitude, we sang about the, the five loaves of fish, and, or five loaves of, I always do that, five loaves of bread, the two fish, you know, that whole story. The disciples, they've seen Jesus act with compassion all throughout his ministry. He heals people. He sets them free from demon possession. He feeds them. Without exception, the crowds come to him, and he's just ministering to them and giving them what they need physically and spiritually. And so in Matthew 14, the, the disciples are with Jesus, and they notice that it's getting late, and the crowd is hangry, right? They're angry and hungry. They, they're ready to eat, and so the disciples come to Jesus and they say, this is a remote place. In other words, there's no McDonald's close by. There's nothing to eat. It's already getting late. And so look, look what the disciples say. They say, send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And what does Jesus respond? He says in Matthew 14, 16, they don't need to go away. He says, you give them something Disciple see, disciple do. That's, that's the concept of following Jesus. Disciple see, disciple do. What would Jesus do when the crowd comes in? Send them away or feed them? And so we have this, back to Matthew 15, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came out to him crying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. Jesus did not answer a word. Why do you think, in this instance, Jesus 
is silence. Is he shocked that they would encounter a Canaanite woman? Is he shocked they would encounter a Gentile in Gentile territory? Or maybe, and just go with me on this here for just a second, do you think Jesus wants to see what his disciples are going to do and say? And what do the disciples do? What do the disciples do? Verse 24, his disciples came to him and they urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Disciple see, disciple do? Or is this just a big old fail? Yeah, you can go back to that picture. Go back to that picture there. Let's, let's keep that up there for just a little bit there. Jesus knew that his disciples had certain thoughts about Canaanite women, or perhaps just Canaanites in general. They were dogs. No, not the cute, cuddly, family pet kind of dog. Dogs weren't kept as pets like we are accustomed to here in America. Dogs were scavengers. Dogs carried diseases. Dogs were unclean. Dogs were pests who lived outside of the city. They didn't get to hang around the dinner table and eat scraps that fell on the floor. And so Jesus knew all along that his fellow Israelites wanted to keep him all to themselves. They would have said, Jesus is ours. Jesus is one of us. Jesus came to save us and deliver us from Rome, not heal a centurion's daughter. Jesus might have come to finish the work of Wiping out the Canaanites. Let me suggest that Jesus is simply giving voice to the biases of his disciples. Jesus is giving voice to his disciples' desire to keep Jesus all to themselves, them and their fellow Israelites. When Eliana turned one years old, we did something that I think a lot of other parents, at least our, of our generation, have done. We got her a smash cake for her first birthday. Anyone do a smash cake or have maybe grandkids where for the first birthday you get them their own special cake. And it's for no other reason than to let them eat and get messy. It's, it's a picture opportunity, am I right? You, you put them in a chair, everybody gathers around. Since you're not watching them open up presents, you watch them destroy a cake because that's what we all want to do. Like inside, like that's, or maybe I'm speaking for myself. That's like my best day ever. You put a cake in front of me, and I'm just going to go to town on it, if it's acceptable. The whole purpose, that's why they call it a smash cake. If you go to Hy-Vee, you go to Price Chopper, you say, I want to get my, my son or daughter a smash cake for their first birthday. It's all so you can smash it down. You can ruin it, destroy it, right? I feel like that is what Jesus is doing in this story. The smash cake could be likened to the idea that this Canaanite woman didn't deserve compassion from Jesus because she was a dog. What his disciples were thinking in their minds when Jesus was silent, and they say, send her away. And so Jesus just smashes that thought outright. He voices it, and then he smashes it. Look at the response of the woman. She says to Jesus, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And in the minds of the disciples, they're probably thinking, how audacious of this dog to think that she can even come close to the table. But then Jesus chimes in at the end of that story. You have great faith. You have great faith. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Jesus speaks out the biases and then he smashes it and he heals the daughter. Jesus is walking among the lampstands of his church all around the world, and he leads us into the regions of Tyre and Sidon. Jesus wants to lead us into the places where we feel uncomfortable with people who we don't feel comfortable around, and he watches to see how his body will imitate 
and be his disciples with other people in this world. Whether, whether it's rooted in racism or nationalism or tribalism or any other ism that there is that we use to divide or separate ourselves, Jesus is watching his church. What are we letting separate and divide us? Jesus calls us to take up our cross and to follow him across borders, across boundaries with good news to those who we might deem to be dogs, even if we don't say it out loud. My friends, there is only one kingdom that is from everlasting to everlasting whose king rules with truth and justice and peace and grace, and love, and this Jesus is gathering all people for himself. He's creating this nation of all tribes and tongues, and I love what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3. Listen to this. Paul says, but now you must put away all anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek, there is no Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all put on then as god's chosen ones holy and beloved compassionate hearts kindness humility meekness and patience disciple see disciple do and so my friends Go and do likewise. Cross boundaries. Seek out the lost. Seek out the confused, the hurting, the outcast, the despised, the unwanted. Seek them all out with compassionate hearts, with kindness, with humility, meekness, and patience. And as we do, may the light of Christ shine brightly in all that we say and all that we do. Let us pray. Gracious Father, gracious Lord, you and your heart for people is what we see and it's what we long to do. You have shown us the way of life, of abundance. You have shown us the way of the kingdom. And you are asking us, you are calling us to follow you. As hard as that may be, as difficult as that may be, Lord, we know that is where true life is found here and in the life to come. And so, Lord, strengthen your church as we have been fed today with good food and as you are now calling us to go and work, to go and strive to live in peace, to forgive and to be forgiven, to accept grace and to show grace, to know truth and to live truth. Lord, that's what we want to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if there's anyone today who is lost, is hurting, confused, if you need someone to talk to or pray with during this service, we invite you to come forward and come pray. I'm standing over here, and Aaron's over here today. I'm sure Aaron would pray with somebody if you came forward, and Aaron loved to do that. And Sarah, she's up here. If you want to talk to someone after service sometime this week, give us a call, send us an email. There's a prayer chapel outside of the narthex. Whatever God is calling you to do, I invite you to have the, the courage to respond to that today. Let us stand up and sing. <clears throat> you were my
Just a reminder, if you're a member, we're going to have a quick congregational meeting after this. But for everyone else, let me invite you, Aaron and Sarah, after this, just go on to the social hall and y'all just love up on them and get to know them. But my friends, disciple see, disciple do. Now go in the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ our Lord. Go in the love of God the Father and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go in peace. Amen. Bless you.